In this video, I'm going to take you on location to different areas around San Francisco that I mentioned in my book. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my channel and leave me a review on Amazon. Those reviews really make a big difference. We'll stay here tonight, she said when she climbed in the back. It's a perfect place. That's Coit Tower right there. She pointed to a concrete column we were parked next to. A really rich lady had that built as a dedication to the firefighters after the big 1906 earthquake. I saw it while we were crossing the bridge, Rachel said. Come check out the view outside. It's amazing, Mama said. We sat on a stone ledge watching the sunset fade to the glimmering lights of the city below. It felt as if we were on top of the world and could see so much from up there. I couldn't wait to explore everything Mama had told us about. Come on in, let's get you out of this cold, Sister Margaret said. You don't want to be homeless forever, she said. These kids would do so much better with a place of their own. I nearly dropped to the floor. Homeless? We're homeless? Up until that moment, I had no idea. I thought homeless people lived on the street like the bums we see. We didn't live on the street. We lived at Raphael House. And it wasn't anything I would have expected from a homeless shelter. From Raphael House, we'd go to Mass at St. Boniface Church, then have lunch at St. Anthony's Dining Room, a place that fed the poor and homeless. For the first few weeks, we had to wait in a long line to get into St. Anthony's, one that went down the street and around the corner, with the smell of body odor, bad breath, alcohol, and pee following us each and every step of the way. It was scary being around so many people, especially since a lot of them seemed to be even more crazy than Mama. Mama was mainly just mean, but those people had full-on conversations with themselves. Some even screamed out cuss words. Mama said they couldn't help it because they probably had something called Tourette Syndrome that made them have no control over what they said. It didn't stop me from being scared, though, especially when an argument or a fight really did break out. Once we made it through the door and walked under the ramp under the statue of St. Anthony, all the chaos and scariness from the street disappeared altogether. The bad odors, the grumpiness, and the arguments stayed outside replaced with the mouth-watering smells of dishes such as chicken a la king or turkey with mashed potatoes and gravy, chicken and dumpling, and pot pies. The meals were so delicious, everything else faded into the background, as if some sort of magical power took over. Look around, Mama said. When people come here, they know they aren't alone in their hardships. Really, take a look. It's like Thanksgiving here. The apartment's in the Tenderloin District, she explained. They call it the Tenderloin because it's in the middle of downtown, just like the Tenderloin of beef is in the middle of a cow. I later learned that there's several stories as to why it's called the Tenderloin. Some say it's named after the Red Light District in New York City, while others argue that it's the soft underbelly of vice in San Francisco, or the cops get paid more for working in such a dangerous area so they can afford beef tenderloin for dinner. Others claim it's a reference to the loins of a prostitute. Whatever the case may be, it was our home now. And if the tenderloin is in the heart of downtown, our place had to be the heart of the tenderloin. Mama pulled up to a large white building on the corner of Eddie and Hyde Streets. Well, here we are, she said, then turned on the hazard lights and double parked. The whole area looks scary, bustling with people, mostly drunks and bums, hanging out in doorways or gathered outside at a bar across the street called the Brown Jug Saloon. Trash blew around us in swirls as if to welcome us to our new neighborhood. A couple stood outside a liquor store that shared the bottom of our building, swaying back and forth as they argued in slurred words. Half-naked ladies with heels as high as stilts paced back and forth on each of the four corners. Y'all see that gate over there? She asked. 
That's an elevator. Can you believe we have an elevator in our apartment? She skipped toward the black iron gate and slid it open by squeezing the metal bars together like an accordion. Isn't this neat? Yeah, Rachel said. It barely fit the five of us, especially with our arms loaded with clothes. Mama pulled the gate closed and pushed the number six button. Then the small cage began to rattle and shake its way upward. We could have walked faster, but it was fun to have a ride. I think I can, I think I can, I teased. Our apartment is in the corner. Number 606, Mama interrupted my thoughts as we approached the sixth floor. We're so lucky it came furnished, but I have to warn you, it's not very big. It's only a studio. Studio? Whatever that is. We raced in the direction she pointed, then waited by a black door at the end of the hall with the brass number 606 nailed to it. Why is the door black? It's so creepy, Rachel whispered. So I'm in my apartment, um, and I lived in, in the Tenderloin, and I'll tell you my adrenaline is a little high right now, but I wanted to give you a taste of what this neighborhood looked like. The prostitutes aren't out on the street anymore, but you can see how crazy it is. Doors are also are not black anymore. Mama finally found schools for me and Rach. Rach went to Notre Dame de Victoire, otherwise known as NDV. A quaint little French Catholic school right up the block from Chinatown and Union Square. Unfortunately for me, NDV's third grade class was full and not accepting new students, so we weren't able to go to the same school together. I was excited to start school again. Don't get me wrong, I liked going to the park every day, but it did get a little old after a while, and I really did want to meet new friends. See how the roof is curved up like that on the corners? Mama asked. I didn't answer, so Josh said, Yeah? Well, those curves are thought to ward off evil spirits in the Buddhist religion. They believe spirits only follow straight lines, so you'll be safe in there. No evil spirits will go on a roof that's curved like that. Wait, what? I sat up straight. This school's not Catholic? No, silly, don't be stupid. I just wanted to point out the Japanese architecture. Of course I'm sending you to a Catholic school. I couldn't wait for this day to arrive. Even when we were still on our summer trip, I couldn't stop thinking about it. The day I started Notre Dame de Victoire, NDV, the same school as Rachel. But even with all my excitement, waking up early on the first day was never easy. I made my way to the bathroom, flipped the switch, then closed the door part way to allow a crack of light to beam through. My uniform had been tantalizing me in the closet ever since the day Mama bought it at the St. Vincent de Paul thrift store. I finally got to dress like a French sailor girl like Rachel. I held up my navy blue top, admired its red tie and collar flap, then slid it over my head. I liked NDV. And it wasn't only for the cute uniforms or the fact that I met two friends right off the bat, Therese and Lori, but because Mom took special pride in our learning French. It was a language she never understood as a child, one that her French mother and aunts spoke secretly in front of her, a language that kept her and her sister isolated and shut out when they were little girls was now back in her life, and she had a chance to learn it along with me as I practiced my vocabulary words each day. It was my opportunity to shine, my moment to make her like me, even if it was only for a few short minutes each day. What in the world do they want from me? Hi, Teresa, Mr. Berger began. He cleared his throat, causing his Adam's apple to move up and down his skinny neck. These gentlemen are from social services. They'd like to ask you a few questions. Huh? What for? I looked down and shifted my weight to the outer edges of my feet, as I always did when I got nervous or scared. Don't worry, you're not in trouble, Mr. Berger said. 
They were making me so nervous with all their questions. I just wanted to leave. And I hated how Mr. Berger kept staring at me. I don't know who called the men to come talk to me either. I never told anyone about Mama. No one. Another lease ended, which meant another move. This time, back downtown. But not in the Tenderloin as before. We were a block from Chinatown, two blocks from the Fairmont Hotel, and four and a half blocks from school, in an area called Knob Hill. Mama called it Snob Hill, but you'd never know it by our apartment. We were back in the studio, roaches and all. Only this one had an extra room, kind of like a bedroom, but way too small to be considered so. Just big enough to squeeze mine and Rachel's bunk bed and our worn-out dresser with the drawers that barely closed. Outside, the sound of cable car bells chimed in the distance as gripmen, cable car drivers, practiced for their annual bell ringing contest. We were in the middle of everything, right on Powell, the same street the cable cars ran on. The street where I found a new type of freedom. Hotels, Union Square, Downtown, Chinatown, North Beach, and Fisherman's Wharf. You name it, I'd explore it. I went everywhere. I knew which hotels had the best views of the city and which had the glass elevators that rode on the outside. I knew the back alleyways of Chinatown and where the little Chinese ladies folded hot fortune cookies by hand. At the bottom of the narrow set of stairs, a large window opened onto the sidewalk. If anyone looked in from the street, they'd be able to see me. I had to get out of there. I'm going to be the laughing stock of the whole building. I hunched over, covering as much of my body as possible with my arms and hands. Then, like a crab, I hobbled sideways down the stairs. I have to hurry. My heart pounded hard and fast as I reached for the doorknob. Please, God, don't let a cable car come. Please. I took a deep breath, pulled the door open, and sprinted down the street. I passed in front of the Chinese restaurant. Please, 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 nobody look, nobody look at me. Went around the corner, then up the steep hill to the back of the building. I don't know who was out there or who saw me naked. The only thing I saw was the blur of the sidewalk in front of me. I peeked through the gate that led to the backyard to make sure I was in the clear, then ran to the back door of our apartment. Luckily, we lived on a big hill, so even though we were on the second floor in the front of the building, around back we were on ground level. I headed to the front of the hotel. Through the windows, I saw the rich people in their nice clothes, talking and smiling, as if they hadn't a care in the world. I wanted to sit on one of the red velvet couches and dream of a future like theirs but I couldn't bring myself to do it, even if it meant getting out of the cold. No way. Not then. Who was I kidding? I wasn't one of them. I'm a street urchin, just like Mama always said. The girl from Powell and Clay whose mother wants her to steal. That's who I am. How could I ever step foot into that hotel again? The Fairmont became a hideout for me, a sort of refuge where I went to escape. I knew the hotel inside and out, the glass elevators with the gold trim that cruised outside the building, the Tonga room, the crown room, the rooftop garden, and the red velvet couches in the lobby. Oh, those red velvet couches. I'd melt into the plush cushions and pretend I was one of the guests as I fantasized of a different life. I knew I was stuck with Mama, and there wasn't anything I could do about that so I dreamt of my future instead. I kicked at the pavement as I walked to the park that separated the Fairmont from Grace Cathedral, then plopped myself on a bench. The cathedral looked beautiful with its large rose window coming to life, acting as a nightlight for the park. The church reminded me of some pictures Madame Thibault showed our French class of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, only this one's not Catholic, it's Episcopalian. I sat on a bench and wondered what Father Mike, the priest from NDV, would think if he knew Mama was trying to make me steal like a thief just so she can wipe her holy ass on paper towels from a rich hotel. What would he think of the nice lady who knelt in the front row of church each morning, clutching a rosary in her hands? The one who acts so righteous while praying for God's forgiveness? 
Mama finally got a job. She worked as a teacher's aide in the kindergarten classroom all the way out in the avenues. It didn't pay much, but it was enough to move us out of the Tenderloin and into the Richmond district. No more bums or prostitutes loitering the streets in that neighborhood, and no more one-room studios. We now had a living room and two bedrooms, one for me and Rach to share, and the other for Mama and the twins. When Mama finished going over the trip, John, Eric, and I hopped on my new Schwinn Stingray and took turns towing each other while I navigated us to all my favorite spots. I showed him around like I owned the place, as if San Francisco was all mine. I took him to a playground, then we rode around the mansions in the Sea Cliff neighborhood, and finally to China Beach. We spent hours bouldering, building driftwood forts, and searching for starfish and fiddler crabs. After we left China Beach, I took him to a cypress tree, way up on a hill overlooking the ocean in Lincoln Park. One that the wind had blown so much it grew sideways, forming a perfect bench. Isn't it beautiful here? I asked. Yeah, kind of scary how high up we are, though. One slip and we're toast. Nah, we're fine. I come here all the time. It's way different from our beaches in Florida, that's for sure, he said. I love how those big rocks jut out of the water like that. He flicked a small twig from his fingers and sent it flying over the edge of the cliff, then shuffled in the dirt for another. How's it been with Mom lately? he asked. Everything inside me shifted. The pride I felt for having it all in San Francisco, for living in the best place in the world, for being the queen of Sea Cliff, that all vanished into the wind as he spoke, causing me to shrivel back to my own pathetic reality. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed my book. My goal is to inspire others to work hard and never let go of their dreams of ending cycles of poverty and abuse to live the life they desire.